Hello and welcome back. We are on chapter 19 of Materials Kinetics, which is broken ergodicity. Uh, so today we are going to cover uh, what is equilibrium, what is ergodicity, what is this word, what does it mean? Uh, we will introduce the concept of the Debran number uh, and discuss uh, broken ergodicity. So what happens when ergodicity is lost? Um, why do we lose ergodicity and what are the thermodynamic implications of broken ergodicity? And then we're going to get to the generalized case of continuously broken ergodicity. So when we started this course back in chapter one, um, I introduced the concept of equilibrium. Um, and one of my favorite definitions of equilibrium is from Professor Richard Feynman, who said in his book, Statistical Mechanics, that equilibrium is, quote, when all the fast things have happened, but the slow things have not. And this does seem a little bit flippant at first, um, but there's actually a lot of truth buried in that quote. It does leave open the question, though, what is fast and what is slow? What constitutes something being fast versus slow? And the insight here is that the definition of fast versus slow depends on your perspective as an observer. It depends on you as the person who is either conducting the experiment or interacting with the material in some way. And if you remember from chapter one, uh, we had this example here of uh, what if you have a uh, cream that is poured into a cup of coffee in a, in a cup um, in a room? And there are different equilibriums that can occur on different time scales. On a very short time scale, there's a homogenization of the cream as it comes to a chemical equilibrium forming the mixture with the coffee. This is something that occurs on a very short time scale, usually in a matter of, of seconds. And then you could either drink the coffee and be done with the experiment, uh, or if you wait on the order of hours, um, then the hot coffee cream mixture uh, will come into thermal equilibrium with the lower temperature room that it's in. So there'll be this heat transfer that occurs and a temperature equilibrium that occurs on a longer time scale of maybe a couple of hours. Um, you could stop the experiment there if you want, or if you continue on over the course of days or weeks, eventually that coffee cream mixture will reach a vapor equilibrium with the environment. Um, each one of these equilibria uh, is a valid equilibrium, and it really depends on your perspective as the observer uh, in terms of what are the physics that you're interested in studying and what is the time scale on which you are observing the system. So um, in that sense, it's relative to you as the observer. And this is really key to the notion of ergodicity. Um, the word ergodic or ergodicity was originally proposed by Boltzmann. Um, and in probability theory, an ergodic dynamical system is one that has the same behavior averaged over time as averaged over the ensemble of all the system states in phase space. In other words, ergodicity implies that the time average of a property is equal to its ensemble average. And that is shown mathematically here. Usually a time average is denoted with an overbar and the ensemble average is denoted with these angle brackets. So basically the time average is what if you take a single system and measure this property P uh, repeatedly over time. And if you measure it now, measure it a minute from now, two minutes from now, three minutes from now, and so on, and take the average of all those measurements over time, that would give you the time average here, which is P bar. On the other hand, you could do an ensemble average instead. The ensemble average involves preparing a set of nominally identical systems um, and then measuring each one of those um, systems in that ensemble. And if you measure the property of each one of them uh, and then take the average over that ensemble, that gives you this ensemble average, which is P within the angle brackets. If the system is ergodic, then the time average is equal to the ensemble average. If the system is non-ergodic, then the time average is different from the ensemble average. And you know, this um, concept of ergodicity is something that is assumed in a lot of physics. It's, it's a pretty common and often unstated assumption in statistical mechanics in many treatments of thermodynamics and even kinetics as well, 
um, there's oftentimes a, a buried assumption of ergodicity without it being explicitly called out. Now, this definition of ergodicity is in terms of the time average being equal to the ensemble average. There's also something else called the ergodic hypothesis, which is slightly different. The ergodic hypothesis states that a system will become ergodic in the limit of long time. In other words, if you allow the system to reach its equilibrium and the limit of infinite time, and then take a bunch of measurements on that system over time, get the time average, that that would be equal to an ensemble average of many identical systems prepared following the same procedure, also in that limit of long time. So the definition of ergodicity is that the time average is equal to the ensemble average, and the ergodic hypothesis states that a system will become ergodic in the limit of long time. So be careful not to confuse those two things. Um, now, one of the concepts that is used to help us understand ergodicity uh, is the Debra number. And this goes back to a paper in Physics Today published by Reiner, I believe back in the 1950s. And uh, this Debra number here, capital D, uh, is defined as the ratio of some internal relaxation time that's internal to the system, so kind of a natural time scale on which uh, kinetics occur within the system. That's in the numerator, and the denominator is an external observation time scale. Or in other words, what is the time scale on which you're performing the measurement of the property or observing the system or conducting some experiment on that system? And the ratio of those two is defined as the Debra number. Now, why is this called the Debra number? Um, it is actually a reference to the Old Testament, uh, the book of Judges, chapter 5, verse 5, where um, you know, depending upon the translation, the wording is different, but one of the translations of that verse says, the mountains flowed before the Lord. This is a quote from the prophetess Deborah in that book of Judges. And, um, and we'll put aside theological implications, but in terms of physics here, um, you know, if we go hiking on the mountains or skiing on the mountains, we do so with the assumption that the mountains are not going to flow underneath our feet, correct? Because we are, um, you know, skiing or walking on a time scale of minutes or hours. And, you know, the mountains do in fact flow. There is continental drift. Mountains are created. They flow. They're destroyed over time. They erode. Um, but that time scale on which mountains flow is a geological time scale that that occurs over, you know, a much, much longer time scale compared to um, how much time that it takes for us to go on a hike or to go skiing on those mountains. So we as individual humans on our human time scale do not observe the mountains flowing. But if we were to observe this on a geological time scale, such as the Lord here being able to observe over, um, you know, the time scale of all the evolution of the earth itself, um, that in fact, the Lord would be able to see uh, the mountains flowing. And so Reiner took that quote then and used it to define this Deborah number, where for us, if we um, are observing the mountains flowing on are observing the mountains on a very short time scale, but the mountains flow on a very long time scale, that means that the internal time scale is a very large number and the observation time scale is a small number. So the Debra number then would be a large number. It would be much greater than unity, or in other words, much greater than one. Uh, on the other hand, if you were to observe the mountains flowing on a longer time scale than it takes the mountains to flow, then this denominator would be greater than the numerator, and the Debra number would be less, or would, would be um, less than one. So this determines whether the system is ergodic or non-ergodic based on you as the observer and the time scale that you're observing the system compared to um, how much time that it takes for the kinetic events to happen. Uh, a classic example of this is actually from the previous lecture. It's um, the physics of the glass transition itself, where this is, say, enthalpy or volume on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. And um, the way that the glass transition works is that there is a liquid at high temperatures, 
and the kinetics within the liquid state are very fast. So that means that the internal time scale is very short because the liquid is flowing rapidly. And in fact, that time scale is short compared to our typical experimental time scale of minutes or hours. And therefore, the Debra number is less than one. And that is indicative of an ergodic system because these, um, whatever events that are happening in the liquid are happening on such a fast time scale that basically the system is given enough time to equilibrate and achieve what the ergodic hypothesis is predicting, which is, you know, any um, transients that are happening in the system have happened on a really short time scale. And then when we take many measurements of a liquid over time, we are measuring the equilibrated liquid and we get the same results as if we were to do an ensemble average of many identically prepared liquids. So that is in the liquid state. The liquid here, it's in equilibrium. It's an ergodic system. As the liquid is cooled, we go leftward on this diagram, and the relaxation time scales go up by orders of magnitude because the viscosity of the liquid is increasing by many orders of magnitude. So the liquid is flowing slower and slower and slower. Um, as that's happening, the Debra number here is increasing because this internal time scale here is increasing by orders of magnitude. Eventually, the internal time scale becomes of the same order as the observation time scale. When that happens, the Debra number is on the order of unity. It is about one. And this is where you are observing the system on the same time scale that its internal kinetics are occurring. And so this is one of the definitions of the glass transition. Uh, it's where the external observation time scale is equal to the internal time scale of the system. And as this liquid is cooled through this glass transition range, there is a continuous breakdown of ergodicity that occurs. This corresponds to a gradual freezing in of the liquid structure into this frozen in glassy state. Now, if you continue to cool, the relaxation time scale continues to increase by orders of magnitude. And therefore, the numerator here becomes much larger than the denominator. We're still observing the system on the same time scale, but the internal kinetics are so much longer. And so the, the Debra number here in this glassy state is greater than one. Um, this is the non-ergodic regime because if you measure the properties over time, um, it's going to be relaxing over time and you're going to get a diff different time average compared to if you prepared uh, many identical glasses and then um, you know, measure its, uh, its ensemble average properties. You'll get two different numbers there and that is indicative of a non-ergodic system. And this also corresponds with the glass having fallen out of equilibrium. So the glass is a non-equilibrium, non-ergodic system. And we can characterize whether that system is ergodic or non-ergodic by the Debra number. If the system is ergodic, that implies a Debra number that is less than one. If the system is non-ergodic, that implies a Debra number that's greater than one. And the transition between the two is this continuous transition that involves a continuous either breakdown of ergodicity if the liquid is cooled or a continuous restoration of ergodicity if the glass is heated back up to the liquid state. Now, there's a lot of really interesting physics behind uh, broken ergodicity, including um, some interesting thermodynamic implications. Uh, one of those thermodynamic implications here is shown in this heat capacity curve for glycerol, which is an organic glass forming system. So if we look at the heat capacity here as a function of temperature, in the liquid state here at high temperatures, the heat capacity is relatively high. And that's because there are both vibrational contributions to the heat capacity, as well as configurational contributions to the heat capacity. As the liquid is cooled and ergodicity is lost, that means that the, um, the structure of the liquid is being frozen into the glassy state. And this is a continuous process that occurs over a range of temperatures. And when that happens, 
the configurational, um, the configuration of the liquid is frozen in. So configurational fluctuations are no longer allowed. And when you take away those configurational fluctuations, this gives you a rather steep drop in the heat capacity, um, such that in the glassy state here at low temperatures, the heat capacity only has vibrational contributions and the configurational contributions are um, very small because the configurational transitions are mostly uh, prohibited in the glassy state. So this big drop in heat capacity that occurs upon cooling a liquid through the glass transition is a direct result of the breakdown of ergodicity that occurs because the configuration of the liquid is being frozen in. So the vibrations are still allowed, but the configurational contributions are lost. So in the glassy state here, the heat capacity, also the thermal expansion coefficient, they're entirely um, governed by vibrations, whereas in the liquid state at high temperatures, um, properties such as the heat capacity and the thermal expansion coefficient have both vibrational and configurational contributions. Now, the um, original physics of broken ergodicity was developed back in 1982 by uh, Professor Palmer at Duke University in this classic paper that was simply called Broken Ergodicity. And Palmer, um, with Palmer's approach, he basically took the entire phase space here, gamma, and he divided it up into a set of disjoint components, uh, gamma sub alpha, where the entire phase space is equal to the union of the phase spaces of all of these individual components. And basically what he was doing is defining these components to be um, such that, that ergodicity is valid within a component, but the ergodicity is broken between components. So in other words, within a component, the system is allowed to freely explore its phase space just within that component, but then transitions between components are forbidden. So all of the phase space is broken into these uh, components here, and then we can apply the standard ergodic statistical mechanics within a given component and then do a suitable averaging over the various components. So this partitioning of the phase space into components obeys two conditions. Uh, the first condition is that of confinement, which means that if you are in a uh, component, you are stuck in that component. Transitions are not allowed between microstates in different components, according to Palmer's assumption. Later on, we're going to relax that assumption when we deal with uh, continuously broken ergodicity. The other um, assumption here is that of internal ergodicity, which means within a given component um, that uh, the system can achieve ergodicity within that component. So all the microstates within a given component are mutually accessible on a time scale that's much shorter than the observation time scale. An example of this is shown here. Let's consider this uh, potential energy landscape that has a, a topography where you can see that there's one component here on the left, which is labeled as component alpha, where all of the inherent structures within that component or all of these microstates within this component have relatively small activation barriers between them. And then there is another component here on the right, which is labeled as component beta. And uh, within component beta, likewise, all of the microstates are accessible among each other. But there is a much larger barrier here between these two components. And that large barrier is, is high enough such that um, transitions are uh, effectively prohibited uh, between uh, these different components. In Palmer's, in Palmer's um, development of the physics, they are strictly forbidden. In reality, of course, there's always going to be some probability of making transitions, and we're going to generalize this theory a bit later. Uh, but for now, following Palmer's approach, he is assuming complete confinement within a given component. So the two conditions are confinement, meaning the transitions are not allowed between the two components here, and then internal ergodicity, meaning that you have um, fast transitions within a given component. Now, buried in this is the assumption of, of the observation time scale here, T observed, being much shorter than the intercomponent um, transition time. So that means that 
we're simply not observing the system for a long enough time to allow these intercomponent transitions to occur. At the same time, the observation time scale is much longer than the intra-component transition time, meaning within a component, these transitions occur on a time scale that is fast compared to the observation time scale. So there are three different time scales that are relevant here. The fastest is the transitions um, within a component. The middle one, the middle time scale is the observation time scale. And then the much longer time scale is the time scale over this larger barrier in between components. Um, then with these assumptions in place, following Palmer's approach, we can apply um, equilibrium statistical mechanics or thermodynamics within a given component uh, and get the relevant properties. For example, this would have an entropy of component alpha, which is S alpha. And this um, component beta, this would have an entropy of component beta, which is S beta. And then the expectation value of the property, um, of the overall property here, in this case, entropy, the expectation value of entropy would be the probability of being in component alpha times the entropy as if you were stuck in component alpha. So that's P alpha times S alpha, plus then the probability of being in component beta times the property value if you were stuck in that component. So it's a weighted average of the properties where it's the probabilities of being in each component times the properties associated with being in that particular component. And if you do that weighted average, that gives you the expectation value of, in this case, entropy, but it could be any property of interest. So the probability of a system being confined within a particular component is equal to a restricted summation of the occupation probabilities of the individual microstates within that component. In other words here, um, the probability of being in component alpha here, capital P alpha, is equal to the probability of occupying all of the microstates within that given component. So if you sum up over all of the microstates I that are contained within component alpha, summing up over all those individual microstate probabilities, that gives you the total probability of being in that component alpha. Then if you were to sum up, of, sum up all of the component probabilities over all the different components here, that would be equal to the summation over all components and then summing up all the individual microstate probabilities within the components. And of course, if you sum up over all probabilities of all microstates, that summation must be equal to one. So summing up over all the component probabilities is equal to one. Um, now, to calculate the statistical mechanics of the broken ergodic system, what we need to do is to calculate the partition functions for each of the individual components. Um, so a direct result of the conditions of confinement and an internal ergodicity um, means that the statistical mechanics of the system can be written in terms of independent partition functions of the components themselves. So for a given component here, alpha, the partition function for that component, Q alpha, would be equal to um, adding up all these Boltzmann probability factors, E to the minus um, energy or internal energy associated with that component over KT. And that summation over all those microstates is just restricted to that particular component. So the component partition function is the is the restricted partition function of all the microstates just within that particular component, then you can apply the partition function um, within the component just as you would with normal ergodic statistical mechanics. If we want to calculate, say, the Helmholtz free energy of the system, um, the Helmholtz free energy is given by the expectation value of the free energy of the individual components. Um, so this would be just as we did before, summing up over uh, the probability of being in, in each component times the property of being stuck in that component. So the probability P alpha times the free energy F alpha of being in that particular component and following standard statistical mechanics, the Helmholtz free energy uh, of being in that particular component of F alpha is just equal to minus KT. So it's minus Boltzmann's constant times temperature times the natural log of 
the partition function. So if we use the partition function for the component, Q sub alpha, that gives you the free energy that is associated with that particular component. Um, and if we combine uh, these equations here, then the expectation value of the free energy um, is shown as follows. The overall Helmholtz free energy of the system is minus kT because the minus kT term is a common factor. So that can be brought out in front. And that's times the summation then of um, all of the component probabilities P alpha times the natural log of the partition function. So if you do this calculation here, that gives you the overall free energy of the system. And this is all based on having internal ergodicity within the component. That's what allows us to um, calculate the partition function within the component. And then this um, assumption of confinement, which is what allows us to do this weighted average shown here. So the equation is expressed as this weighted average since, in general, um, it is not known in which component the system is trapped. I mean, we do not know a priori um, if we are in component alpha or beta or gamma or whatever. We only know that there's a certain probability associated with each of those components. And so this summation then accounts for all the different possible components the system could be in and their respective probabilities. Um, likewise, we can calculate the energies of the system. Uh, the energy is actually fairly straightforward because if we were to do this calculation of the, say, the internal energy of the system as being this um, weighted summation of the component probabilities with the internal energy associated with those components, and then break, that, break up the uh, component internal energy into the microstate internal energy, what we see is that the component probabilities actually cancel out and that um, we just get the same value as if we were to do the weighted average of the individual microstate um, probabilities multiplied by microstate internal energies. And the interesting thing here is that what this means is that the, um, the breakdown of ergodicity or whether you have an ergodic or a non-ergodic system doesn't actually affect the energy of the system. It does not affect the internal energy. There's no change of the internal energy as a result of having an ergodic or non-ergodic system, but there is a difference in entropy and there is a difference in free energy. Um, for the entropy, in this case, we've got the S alpha. This is the entropy associated with each component. This is equal to minus Boltzmann's constant and then times, then this would be um, summation over all the microstates within the component alpha. Using the Gibbs formula, it is um, PI over P alpha times the logarithm of PI over P alpha. So the individual probabilities would sum up to one within the given component here with this proper normalization by uh, P alpha. This gives you the entropy of being in uh, component alpha. And then if we were to do that weighted average here, the entropy in their non-ergodic system is less than the entropy of the ergodic system because in the ergodic system, all the transitions are allowed. So all the configurations can be explored because they're all accessible. In the non-ergodic system, not all of the um, transitions are accessible. Some of them are forbidden. And so the system is restricted to a fewer number of microstates, which means that the entropy of the non-ergodic system is less than the entropy of the ergodic system. And that's what's shown here mathematically. If we denote the time average calculation of the entropy of the non-ergodic system, this is the S bar. This is always less than or equal to the ensemble average entropy of the system. Or if we write this out in terms of the definitions of the entropies, the left-hand side here is the, um, the time average entropy of the non-ergodic system, uh, where you've got the summation of, over all the components, the summation of all the microstates within the component, and then, um, if you have the P alpha, and then there's a P alpha in the denominator, they cancel out. And what you're left with is PI, the microstate probability times the natural log of PI over P alpha. And this is necessarily less than or equal to, on the right-hand side would be the ensemble average um, entropy, which is just the summation of the PI log PI. So the difference is 
that on the left-hand side, there's a division by uh, the P alpha within the logarithm. And this leads the time averaged entropy to be less than the ensemble averaged entropy for the non-ergodic system. Now, the difference between these two entropies, the um, ensemble averaged entropy minus the time averaged entropy has a name, and that is called the complexity of the system and is denoted with a capital I. So the difference between the entropy of the ergodic and the broken ergodic systems, which is the same thing as saying the difference between the ensemble average entropy and the time average entropy is called the complexity of the system and it is denoted I. And if you put in those equations for the ensemble average entropy on the left here and the time average entropy on the right and combine um, all the like terms, what you will see is that the complexity here is equal to minus Boltzmann's constant times than this um, Gibbs Gibbsian entropy of just the components themselves. So P alpha log P alpha. This is the entropy that is lost when an ergodic system becomes a non-ergodic system. In other words, this is the entropy that is lost when the phase space is partitioned into components. And when you've got the probabilities of being in each of those components as P alpha, the entropy that's lost in not being able to transition between components is this P alpha log P alpha. So that is the entropy that is lost in going from an ergodic system to a non-ergodic system. Um, and there's you know, an interesting implication here uh, with respect to the third law of thermodynamics uh, and that this complexity is also a measure of the non-ergodic, uh, non-ergodicity of the system. And if you have a completely confined system, meaning a system that is trapped in a single microstate, such as what you have in the limit of absolute zero temperature, in the limit of absolute zero temperature, then each individual microstate is its own component. Because at absolute zero temperature, no matter where you're stuck, no matter what microstate you're in, transitions are forbidden. And so in that limit of absolute zero temperature, every component has one and only one microstate, which means that microstate probability within that component is one, and the logarithm of one is zero. And in that case, this um, entropy of the non-ergodic system is zero. And this falls out naturally from Palmer's uh, formulation of broken ergodicity. Um, and it actually shows why uh, broken ergodicity is necessary physics in order to um, reconcile non-equilibrium systems with the third law in thermodynamics. Because if you were to do the same calculation for an ensemble average entropy, that's telling you, oh, I don't know which microstate I'm in. I could be in any of these microstates, and you'd end up with a non-zero entropy at absolute zero temperature, which is, uh, of course, a violation of the third law. Um, what Palmer realized with his formulation of broken ergodicity is that it doesn't matter which one that you're in. The macrostate of the system is given by um, one and only one microstate, regardless of which microstate it is that you're trapped in. That you're trapped in, and so regardless of where you are, you are trapped there, and the macrostate is determined by one and only one microstate, and therefore the actual um, entropy of the non-ergodic system in the limit of zero temperature is in fact zero, and this is consistent with the third law of thermodynamics. Um, so what are some of the implications of broken ergodicity? Um, the breakdown of ergodicity itself is what's called a partitioning process, meaning that we're taking this larger phase space and we're partitioning it into components. This partitioning process necessarily results in a loss of entropy because the system is becoming trapped in a subset of the phase space. It's not allowed to freely explore beyond the boundaries of its components, and therefore there is a loss of entropy. And since there's a loss of entropy, there's a corresponding increase of free energy. Um, and then there's no change in the internal energy or the enthalpy as we've shown. So entropy goes down, free energy goes up, no change in the internal energy or the enthalpy. Um, 
This satisfies the principle of causality, which states that the properties of a system can only be affected by the microstates that are actually visited. Um, so in this limit of, say, absolute zero temperature, the properties are governed entirely by whichever microstate that the system is in. And so it's only one microstate, um, which means that the entropy is zero. Now, relaxation is what's called a unifying process. A unifying process is the opposite of a partitioning process. Um, during a unifying process like relaxation, the ergodicity of the system is restored um, as the time um, time scale increases. So as you increase the observation time scale, you're giving more time for configurational transitions to occur. And in this limit of long time, the ergodicity is spontaneously restored. So this relaxation behavior is a spontaneous process that involves a restoration of ergodicity by unifying components into until they eventually become just a single component over all of the phase space. Now, there's a lot of physical insights here from Palmer's approach, uh, but there are also some limitations. Uh, in many real systems, it is difficult to partition the, the um, landscape or the phase space since there may not be a clear separation between um, slow and fast timescales. So that uh, example landscape that I showed you had a very clear uh, largest barrier, and then within the components, there are very clear smaller barriers. But generally speaking, there doesn't need to be this clear partitioning into fast and slow timescales. Uh, another limitation of the Palmer approach is that this condition of confinement never strictly holds at any non-zero temperature. So even though Palmer's assuming that transitions are not allowed at all um, between components, the reality is that at any temperature that is greater than zero, there is a probability of those transitions happening, so we should be able to account for them. Um, also, uh, what if the Debra number is on the order of unity? So there, the kinetics are too fast to assume confinement and also too slow to assume ergodicity. So the Palmer approach is fine in the liquid state where the entire phase space is one component. It's fine in, say, a low temperature glassy state, for example, where um, you know, you've got a large amount of confinement. But what if you're in the middle? What if you're in the glass transition re regime itself? Palmer's approach really can't be applied there. Um, and what we need to do for real systems and for the most general case is to characterize the system uh, by a continuous breakdown of ergodicity. So continuously broken ergodicity is a generalization of Palmer's concept of broken ergodicity, which was introduced by myself uh, and my good friends here, Prabhat Gupta and Roger Laux, uh, back in 2007. And with continuously broken ergodicity, this considers some arbitrary potential energy landscape. So this energy landscape can have any topo topography that you want. It doesn't matter, and there doesn't need to be a, a separation between fast and slow time scales. Whatever the landscape is, this can be applied um, equally well. The key is that we consider two types of probabilities. Um, the first type is the normal basin occupation probability, P sub i. P sub i is just the probability of the system being in a particular basin, and that is a function of the thermal history of the system. This is the same probabilities that we normally deal with. Uh, but then we introduce a second type of probability, which is a conditional probability, F i j. This conditional probability has two uh, subscripts, uh, i comma j, because it is the um, probability of reaching this second basin here if you start in the first basin. So fij says, if you were to start in basin i, what is the probability of ending up in basin j um, after evolving the system for some amount of time here, which is the observation time scale T observed, and for whatever thermal history that the system undergoes. So whatever that thermal history is, if you evolve the kinetics of the system for the observation time scale, after starting in this, um, this starting basin here I, what's the probability of ending up in basin uh, J? And that is Fij. 
So with these two different types of probabilities, um, let's consider first some limiting behaviors. So if you've got um, either the limit of zero observation time or the limit of zero temperature, in, those, in either of those limits, no transitions are allowed because either uh, you have no time to make a transition in the limit of zero time, or um, you've got no thermal energy to make a transition in the limit of zero temperature. So in that case, the FII, the conditional probability of the system starting in I and ending up in the same basin I, that is equal to one. And the FIJ not equal to I is equal to zero because it's impossible to get anywhere else. Um, in other words, the conditional probability in that limit is equal to what's called a Kronecker delta function. So it's equal to one when the two indices are the same, and it's equal to zero when the two indices are different. Now, if we go down here to the bottom and the limit of a very long observation time, in the limit of, a, of infinite observation time, where you start doesn't matter. Um, and that is because of the ergodic hypothesis. As long as the landscape is fully connected in the limit of infinite time, the system is going to equilibrate, and the probability of being in that final microstate J is simply the equilibrium probability of being in J, and that does not matter where you started. And so in that case, the Fij is just equal to the equilibrium Pj. Um, so that limit, it's fully ergodic, and it's a you know ergodicity is fully restored, um, and the system has equilibrated, and the conditional probabilities don't matter where you start, all they, they just follow the equilibrium probabilities of where you end up. And so what this means is that in the ergodic limit, um, this formulation of continuously broken ergodicity just recovers exactly the equilibrium ergodic statistical mechanics that we're already used to. Now for everything in between, for a finite observation time at a finite temperature, these conditional probabilities then are telling you um, how much of the phase space that the system is able to explore having started in an original microstate here, I. Um, and so these FIJs capture everything that's in between these two extreme limits of either being fully confined or um, being fully equilibrated. The FIJs can capture everything in between, regardless of the topography of the landscape, the um, thermal history of the system, or the amount of observation time. And so this is what enables the system to account for the continuous breakdown of ergodicity. It's this, um, the actual calculation of the, uh, configure of, the, of the conditional probabilities. So mathematically for this fully confined system, so for the limit of zero observation time, which is also the limit of zero temperature, in that case, the conditional probabilities Fij are equal to the Kronecker delta function, delta Ij, which is equal to one if I equals J, because you've got a 100% probability of staying in the same microstate where you started, and it's equal to zero if I is not equal to J, because there's a zero probability of transitioning someplace else. And of course, this would naturally give um, an entropy of zero in the limit of absolute zero temperature consistent with the third law. Um, on the other hand, in the ergodic limit, so in the limit of an infinite observation time, then the conditional probability here, Fij, becomes just Pj equilibrium. The I doesn't even matter. And this is just the equilibrium probability, which is one over the partition function of the system times e to the minus um, internal energy or enthalpy of that microstate J over Kt. So this conditional probability Fij gives the probability of transitioning to microstate J after an initial measurement in the state I and evolving through some observation time here, T observed. Um, now, the next thing we need to do is to calculate the conditional prob prob or the conditional properties. For example, uh, one can define the conditional entropy of the system having started in microstate I. And that conditional entropy of having started a microstate I would be given as SI, and that's equal to minus Boltzmann's constant times then the summation over all of the microstates J that you could end up with. And then we use the conditional probabilities um, in that calculation of the conditional entropy. So it's the FIJ 
uh, log Fij after evolving for whatever amount of observation time that the system has evolved for. This gives you the calculation of the entropy, the configurational entropy of the system having started in microstate I. And if there's a probability of having started there, which is just the basin occupation prob probability PI, then we can calculate the expectation value of the entropy um, as shown in the bottom equation. So the expectation value of the entropy is simply then the weighted um, summation here, the weighted average of these uh, probabilities of, of starting in each of the microstates I times the property value if you had started in the microstate. So in this case for the entropy, it is the entropy of having started in each microstate I times the probability of starting there. And this formulation gives you a complete description of the thermodynamics and the statistical mechanics of any system, regardless if it is a fully confined, fully non-ergodic system, a uh, fully er ergodic system, or anything in between. So this is um, you know, equally applicable uh, across all of these um, various regimes. Um, and in fact, here, this if we plug in all of these uh, values here, like the limit of zero observation time scale, you can see that that recovers, um, that that reduces to the Kronecker delta function for the conditional probabilities, which shows you a zero entropy in the limit of a fully confined system, um, like Palmer's approach, consistent with the third law of thermodynamics, and the limit of an infinite observation time in this ergodic limit, the conditional probabilities just become the um, equilibrium probabilities and you end up with the equilibrium entropy. So some of the implications of continuously broken ergodicity. Uh, first, it simplifies to the equilibrium Gibbs entropy for an ergodic system. It also reduces to the Palmer approach for the special cases of a discontinuously broken ergodic system. So if you have, if Palmer's assumptions are incorporated, like if, if you strictly do have confinement and internal ergodicity, the continuously broken ergodicity form, formalism recovers the Palmer approach exactly. Also entropy is zero and the limit of zero temperature or zero observation time. Um, this limit of zero temperature is consistent with uh, Boltzmann's notion of entropy as uh, related to the number of microstates that yield a particular macrostate and consistent with um, the third law of thermodynamics. And this limit limiting behavior for zero observation time scale is consistent with the principle of causality because the properties of a system can only be affected by the actual microstates that are explored by that system. And finally, ergodicity is restored in the limit of infinite observation time uh, for any finite temperature. Um, this shows you some example calculations here. This would be the volume temperature diagram for a glass forming system. In this case, it's selenium. Um, this is as a function of cooling rate, uh, covering 25 orders of magnitude cooling rate, or for the really fast cooling rates here, the system is uh, undergoing the ergodic to non-ergodic transition or experiencing broken ergodicity at much higher temperatures because of the shorter time scale that is involved at much slower uh, cooling rates, the system, the system is able to stay in equilibrium uh, down to much lower temperatures before falling out of equilibrium and experiencing that breakdown of ergodicity. And you can see how the molar volume then depends on that full thermal history. If you were to calculate the configurational entropy under those same conditions, you can see that the um, faster cooling rate uh, undergoes the breakdown of ergodicity at higher temperatures. Therefore, it's losing configurational entropy at higher temperatures compared to the slower cooling rates. And even though those configurational entropies become very small, um, strictly speaking, they don't become zero until you reach uh, absolute zero temperature. Same thing with the supercooled liquid. This maintains a higher configurational entropy. And then this comes down and eventually um, becomes zero at absolute zero as well. So everything is consistent with the third law. So to summarize here, broken ergodicity results um, from having an internal relaxation time scale that's much longer than the external observation time scale. As ergodicity is broken, configurational degrees of freedom are lost, and those contributions to thermodynamic and statistical mechanical properties are lost. So we can, um, in the most general sense, 
uh, described as using conditional probabilities within this framework of continuously broken ergodicity. All right, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.